better place to be on a Sunday morning than in the house of the living God with his people in a place where his presence can and will flow freely in this house. Amen. I believe this is a house of miracles. This is a house of signs and wonders. This is a house of healings. This is a house where the miraculous can take place before you step out those doors. Amen. Does anybody believe that? Why don't you lift your hands and begin to worship a little bit. Lift your hands and say, Lord, I worship. Hallelujah, Lord, we're calling on your name. Jesus, we believe that there is a work to be done in this house, God. Lord, your people are here united in body and in faith. Lord, we are trusting and believing that the miraculous can and will happen. Lord, we serve a God that is true to his word. Your word is, oh, hallelujah. Lord, you do not lie. Your word does not lie. It does not return void. Hallelujah, Lord. We ask that you would have your way in this place. Any hindrance, any distraction, any attack of the adversary, Lord, we bind it right now in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, let your spirit flow freely in this place. Hallelujah. Somebody lift up a shout of praise. Hallelujah.
Come on, would you just respond to what you're feeling in this house right now? Come on, the Holy Ghost is ministering all over this room right now. Come on, the Lord's reaching into people's lives right now to bring healing, to bring growth, to bring transformation. Look at somebody near you and say, this is my day. This is my day. Hallelujah. We were in the prayer room before church today. That's that little room right there. If you've never been in there, you ought to try it out. It's a powerful place. We gather in there every Sunday morning at 1015, and we stay in there till 1045. And what you stepped into here today, we got it going in there at 1015. Amen. And at the end of that prayer gathering, I began to talk to the folks in there. And I said, let me tell you what I feel like the Lord has put in my spirit. How many of you all know what this year is all about? It's all about growth and healing, right? Growth and healing. And the Lord began to talk to me this week. And he brought that verse to my mind, laid hands on the sick and they shall recover. And the Lord said, when there's growth and healing, there is recovery. He said, and there's going to be a recovery in people's lives. Oh, hallelujah. Where there's been damage, where there's been hurt, where there's been loss, where there's been pain, there's going to be recovery. There's going to be recovery. Hallelujah. Let me tell you something. There are people in this room right now that God is reaching for you. And that word resonates with you and you're thinking in your mind, God, I need recovery. I need it in my family. I need it in my mind. I need it in my well-being. I need it in my finances. Uh, there are areas of my life where I need recovery. If that's you, you need to step out of your aisle right now this morning. You need to walk down that aisle and you need to come right down here to the front because there is a river of living water that is flowing in this building tonight. And there is healing in that water. What does that mean? The Bible says that everything the water touched would be healed. Hallelujah. So if you want that recovery in your life, this is where you need to be. I can watch a river from a far distance, but there's a whole lot of difference between looking at it from a hundred yards away and walking up to it and touching the water. And I'm taking my time because some of you haven't moved yet. But there are people that haven't moved yet that need to move this morning. And the Lord's already been pulling on your heart. And this is the moment to respond. We're going to begin to pray. And if that's you and you're still in your seat, I'm encouraging you that as we begin to pray with these folks that have gathered up here at the front this morning, that you can just slip on up here when everybody else's eyes are closed and you can get right in here in what God is doing and you can receive some recovery for your life. Amen? Church family, I want you to close your eyes and stretch your hands this way. Ministry, I want you to help me and just make your way here to the front. Brother Marcus, if you'd come and help us. Hallelujah, Brother TJ, come on. Hallelujah. And I want you to begin to minister to those folks that have walked up here right now. Because there's going to be a recovery. There's going to be a recovery. Lord, we take authority and dominion. Oh, where there's been damage. Where there's been loss. Oh, where there's been defeat. Where there's been sickness. Where there's been pain. Oh, we speak recovery right now right now. We speak recovery right now. Lord, let a river begin to flow right now. Show that they would be made right in their mind. That healing water will begin to flow. My name, he changeless testifies.
Can we just thank the Lord right now? Come on. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, God's ministering all over this house. Praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, it just feels good in the Holy Ghost to me to not interrupt the flow of what is happening in this service. So I, I talked with Brother Godwin. And we are in agreement that this would just be a really good time for him to come and minister. And so we're going to skip over some of the preliminaries that we typically have in a service. And we're going to bring the man of God to this pulpit. Amen. So what I'm asking you to do is at the conclusion of whatever Brother Godwin preaches here today, no doubt there will be an altar response. But at the conclusion of that response... Church family, I'm going to ask you to just hang out for just a little bit and not run out the door because there are some things we want to say to you and then we are going to give you an opportunity to give in the returning of your tithes and offerings at the conclusion of our altar service here today. How many of you are excited to hear from the Lord this morning? Amen. Have you enjoyed the ministry of Brother Godwin today? Praise God. Come on, would you welcome the man of God to this pulpit? Brother Godwin, come and speak what the Lord has put on your heart. Well, high five somebody and say, Jesus is in the house. Amen, amen. Thank the Lord. What a great service. And I'm not surprised the presence of the Lord is here like he is after the week that we've had together. Can you say amen? Amen. You got your Bibles, let's turn to Matthew 16, verse 13. And we're going to talk to you what I feel the Lord wanted me to say to this great church of people. We appreciate Brother Azalini, your pastor. How many of you love him? Yeah. Amen. And his great wife. Yeah. Amen. And them kids. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. I'm telling you now. I told them kids, somebody mess with you, call me. I'll repent when I get done handling them. <laughs> I got your back, Jack. Hallelujah. We appreciate these young kids and their worship and love for God. It's good to see the mama. Hallelujah. <laughs> Sister Azalini, we appreciate her. She's been working. High five somebody and say it won't be for long. Be for long. Amen. We're going to get that woman of God as soon as possible down here and all the home folks look at each other and say, if we'll all pay our tithes, she can come home. Amen. Just say amen or ouch because I'll preach on it now. I'll put you in the altar. Amen. You don't want to go to hell because you didn't pay your tithes. Can a man rob God? And he was talking about paying tithes. Well, I got about eight amens. But amen. Tell somebody, I don't want to owe God. So you pay your tithes and then you give your offerings and, and the church, and that's when the church will explode. Amen. So we appreciate her sacrifice and their sacrifice and your sacrifice. Amen. For everything you're doing to catapult this church into a great revival. Thank you, all 22 of you, I think I counted. All the home folks said amen. amen. There, that's the way I like it. Hallelujah. Unanimous amen. So we appreciate all of you, Pastor and his wife, appreciate amen. Uh, the home folks, and we love you, and we just appreciate you very much. Appreciate Brother and Sister Easterling and the church from just across the river. Amen. I love them very much. And, and Presbyter Easterling, amen. Amen. I don't know much how much higher that's going to go, but that office could keep going up. Amen. Who knows? Amen. I don't know. We have to talk to the church about that, but amen. He's doing great where he's at, and amen, doing a wonderful work. And this is his home church where he prayed through and his wife, and somebody ought to say amen. amen. So we're thankful for the hookup and holy connection we feel between these two churches. Matthew 16, 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, others Jeremiah, or 
Others begin to say, I've heard him call one of the prophets. And they're laughing. You know how a bunch of men are. Man, I can't believe the stuff I've heard. And, and Jesus, I look up and Jesus. Now, why am I doing that? Well, I went to ABI, Apostolic Bible Institute, St. Paul, Minnesota. And we did dramas the last three years of school. Last month was always drama practice. So, I mean, when I get to talk about this, I just see a drama. And I just see them sitting around a fire and. They, Jeremiah's one of the prophets, man. They just laughing and key hawing, man, taking a bite of fish. And they look up at Jesus, just whew, they get quiet. He says, Well, who do you say I am? They started looking at each other. And Simon Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus responded and said, And blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I want to talk to this church for just a few moments on you are who God says you are. Come on, high five three people around you and say, I am who God says I am. Come on, tell somebody else, I am who God says I am. Amen, amen. The Lord bless you. You may be seated. Throughout history and philosophers have speculated on the reasons for man's existence, our purpose, and what is the meaning of our human life? Ancient Greeks believed life is cyclical, continually repeating itself in endless circles, going nowhere with no purpose. When you keep studying that thought, and modern thinkers believe that life is just pointless and futile. Dr. G.N. Clark stated in his inaugural address as president of Cambridge University, there is no secret and no plan in history to be discovered. Andre Moreau, the French novelist and critic, said the universe is indifferent. Who created it? Why are we here on this puny mud heap spinning in infinite space? I have not the slightest idea, and I'm convinced that no one else has. Jean-Paul Sartre, a famous existentialist and philosopher, said, Man exists in a watertight compartment as an utterly isolated individual in the midst of a purposeless universe. Jacques Monod, a French molecular biologist, declared that man's existence is due to a chance collision between minuscule particles of nucleic acid and proteins in a vast prebiotic soup. Look at somebody and say, well, them men are super smart. <laughs> Many advocate yet would deny the humanist philosophy inevitably concludes that there is no real difference between a man and a tree. And therefore, killing a man is no different than chopping down a tree. It is these and many other concepts, philosophies, and ideas that lend hand to and give credence to the ever-increasing rise of depression and hatred and Abortions and suicides and murders. But I feel like God wants you to hear what he has to say about you. God wants you to come out of the low lands of loneliness and the plains of purposelessness. And I could go on. The quicksands of suicide. The anemic slide of alcoholism and the death grip of drug addiction. But you must hear what God has to say about you. Colossians 1 and 16 says, For by him, God, 
were all things created. There was no nucleic acid that exploded, no little minuscule particles of acid that just bumped into each other and kabooza. Here we all are. But by him, all things were created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions, principalities or powers, all things, everybody say all things, were created by him and tell somebody for him. Touch your neighbor and say, I was created. Tell him you were created by God and for God. Can I tell somebody somewhere that's got to click in your mind and your spirit and you've got to stop this anemic slide into purposelessness and habits and addictions. And we say in New Orleans, cray cray in the couillon. All this crazy in the head. There's three levels of revelation that the word of God deals with in our text. When Jesus is questioning the twelve, he said, Whom do men say thy son? And the disciples began to say among themselves, John the Baptist, Elias, Jeremiah, one of the prophets, and they're laughing and cutting up. Jesus said, Well, who do you say I am? You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Well, the question was, Who am I, the Son of Man? The answer was, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered and said, and blessed art thou, Simon, my blood, Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter. And upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatsoever thou bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. The question was, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? Peter answered, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. He is son of man because he's born of woman. But he is son of God because he is fathered by God. Matthew chapter 1, if you look at that, it's a long list of begats. It says so-and-so begat, so-and-so begat. It's one man begat or fathered a son, and that man fathered a son, and that man fathered a son, that man fathered a son, and, or begat, 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 begat. And all of a sudden say, so-and-so begat Joseph, who was the husband of Mary, of whom was born Christ. What did it just say? I remember where I was when I was reading and studying. This just wow, jumped off the page at me. I said, oh my God. What, what just happened was the sin of Adam has been handed down. With every child that is born, the sin of Adam is handed off to that child. And when that child begets a child, the man, when that child begets a child, that, that child begotten of that man becomes a sinner. And when he begets a child, that child begets becomes a sinner and that everybody is born in sin through a woman but we are begotten in sin because of our father. Everybody in here has the blood of your daddy in you. Touch your neighbor and say, I ain't got none of mama's blood. I know that always gets giggles and most women don't say nothing. They're like, what you talking about? I'm not the fool you are. You want to talk about that. But I'm just sorry. We ain't got your blood. Now we got our bodies and our flesh because of you. But our blood comes from the determining factor, which is our daddy. Now the real biblical reason is this is how sin of Adam is transferred to each of us. Now the women will say amen. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I ain't got nothing to do with this sin thing. Hallelujah. All the women can elbow your husband and say, you the responsible for this. <laughs> Amen. So the man, so we just keep handing off Adam's sin. We are born 
in sin. And we are shaping in iniquity. Iniquity, self-will. Jesus was born of Mary. Well, who fathered him? God fathered him. Now, actually, truthfully, the Bible says the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, overshadowed Mary. So now, if the Trinity was right, then you should be calling Jesus Christ the Son of the Holy Ghost. If the Holy Ghost is different from God. Now stay with me now. Y'all getting quiet. I know I got you right where I need you. Remember, amens will keep you out of trouble. <laughs> but when you get quiet, I got you. <clears throat> Amen. You got a lot of folks say amen. <laughs> I'm going to learn. Took three services, but we got it now. Hallelujah. I feel a little push coming. Amen. Jesus was born of Mary. And he said to Mary, Thou, that which you conceived in use of the Holy Ghost. What happened? The Spirit of God. God overshadowed Mary. And in that and the overshadow means a hazy brilliance came on. And in that moment of the Spirit of God coming over Mary, the hazy brilliance coming, God put his word, which Logos is seed, in her body, which impregnated the egg that was in her womb. And at that impregnation, when that first cell appeared, It was God manifested in flesh. The flesh of that. Because in that first cell is all the stuff, the chromosome, everything, all the structure. I mean, we know exactly what that little fella going to be. Or that little girl. But then that one cell becomes two and it becomes four, becomes eight, becomes 16, becomes 32, becomes 64, becomes 128. I can't think that fast anymore. I mean, he just won 20, 128 cells. He just kept, it was God in that flesh. It was God in that. It was God in that. It was God. It was God in that flesh. It was God in that material. It was God in the body. And the Holy Spirit, which is God, because God is a spirit, overshadowed Mary. And so the Bible says, the Lord said, that this is the Son of God. He didn't say it's the Son of the Holy Ghost. I'm trying to help people. You're quiet. Remember, just say amen. amen. So the Holy Ghost, which is God, because God is spirit, amen. overshadowed Mary. She conceives, and then nine months later, a child is brought forth, and that child is the son of man because the woman gives birth to him, but he's the son of God because God fathered him. Amen. He is God manifested. In flesh. Great is the mystery of godliness. For God was manifest. Everybody say God. God. Tell somebody the one God. The one true God. Overshadowed that woman. Caused her to be pregnant. I mean look at somebody say. His, he caught that stuff was going to come out. But I mean, he said what was right. Amen. Caused her to be pregnant. And when she conceived. He got in that body. Why? Because now God through this body is going to feel what temptation feels like. For the Bible says he was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin, which means he made it through the temptation. God, I mean, God never been tempted, never felt anything like that in his life. But he gets in a human body. Now he knows. God was manifested in flesh. Why did he do that? He did that because he wanted to pay the price 
for our sins. John 4, 24, God is a spirit. John 1, 18, no man has seen God at any time. The seen means to see with the eyes or discern clearly or to stare at. John 1, 14, but the word was made flesh. In the beginning was the word, verse 1. The word was with God and the word was God. It didn't say it was a God. It didn't say it was one third of God. It didn't say it was a part of God. It said the word, the thought was with God. And the thought was God. What was God thinking? He was thinking about himself. Colossians 1 and 15 says, Who is the image of the invisible God? The man Christ Jesus is the image. Image here is likeness, profile, representation, or the faintness of copy of the invisible, that which cannot be seen. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Why? Because God, when he started thinking, he became what he thought. The Greek philosopher Herlachides first used the term logos around 600 B.C. to designate the divine reason or plan which coordinates a changing universe. So now you could read John 1.1 1, 1 like this. In the beginning was the divine reason. And the divine reason was with God. And the divine reason was God. Touch somebody and say God was thinking about himself. Now I, I, I'm going slow here. Why? Because before he said let there be light. He had a thought. And what God thinks, he thinks from the end. Back to the beginning. He saw us today. He saw the mess we were in. He saw the sins you committed yesterday. Tonight. He may saw the sins you committed today. He saw the sins you committed three months ago, two years ago, 12 years ago, 15, 22 years ago. He saw it all. And when he saw, look at somebody and say, God knew I was going to make a mess. He saw my mess before I was even here. Come on. And what did God do? God said, let there be light. God thought about us way before he said, let there be light. But after he thought about us, he said, I can handle that. Let there be light. Come on, somebody. God said, you weren't an, you're not an accident. You didn't just erupt here. You just didn't accidentally end up here. Touch somebody and say, I am the thought of God. Tell somebody God's been thinking about you. Now you may be 18 or 19 and you're wondering, well, how come I just heard of God about now? I've been, you know, I'm 19, I'm 22 and I don't understand this. My first two or three times I've been to church and I'm just like, I don't know about this. How come I just know about it? Well, you've been walking this way to the end of your life. God's been walking from the end of your life. And he called a preacher, got somebody or your girlfriend or your wife or your sister or your brother, came to church, got the Holy Ghost, and, and then it just walked in. You're just like, what? What do you mean no more drugs? What do you mean? What do you mean no more drinking? What do you mean you're on a jack around that crazy? What do, you, what do you mean? We've been doing this all our life. Well, I just, I went to church. You went to what? Now, what's that? What's church? Brothers, wife he's with now, he, he's a backslid preacher, but he's with her now, and, and uh, uh, he started talking to her about church, and she said, what? You mean church, what are you talking about? He said, you've never been to church? He said, I don't even know what you're talking about. He called me and said, Greg, she's never, she said, I've never been to church. I, why don't I go to church? She said, have you never been to a church for a funeral? She said, no. A wedding? No. You've never been to church? No, I've never been to any kind of church. He started talking to her a bit. She started crying. She said, well, she said, if you want me to, I'll go. Last year this time, his daughter had a baby and was dedicating it. So we flew out there for it, me and my wife and my mom. And a bunch of us was out there. And we got that little church, about 80 people there that morning. We're sitting on the front row. And I got to, we got to worship. And I looked kind of corner of my eye. 
look back, see what she was doing, and I watched her. She was back there. Just what she was doing. She was going. Reading the word. Now we had, you know, typical Pentecost church had saved people in there, looked all apart, and they were sitting there going. And we got this wonderful lady in the first 43 or 44 in the first service of any kind in her life and you are sitting there that wasn't in my notes it just got on it and I can't help it I just but thank God she was She's trying to sing. She's trying to read the words. Trying, she don't know. And I look, kept looking back, and I caught her one time going, I went, oh, go ahead, Jesus. So Pastor told me I stand there. He said, now, we're going to do this baby dedication. It's going to be a big deal. It went like 45 minutes. So it was a big deal, I guess. He said, I, he said, I want you to preach when you, when you get done. I said, now, look, folks. I don't know what you got here in this church member, but I'm focusing on her. I'm going to be short, quick, and sweet, right to the point. We'll give an altar call. He said, whatever you want. In about eight minutes, I would went through Calvary. I'd watch. I would went through the resurrection and got to the day of Pentecost in eight minutes. Boom, shaka, laka. I gave the altar call. Now, we'd been in church about two hours and 15 minutes. So when I gave the altar call, people started coming. I mean, the church is warm. It was one of the best altar calls I've ever seen. I've been preaching 40 years, 33 of them evangelized. It was boom, shakalaka. I mean, everybody came. And when she, she was moving, I said, oh, my God. I said, Come on, God, I'll give you the Holy Ghost. She turned and went out. I thought, oh, my God. We had four or five people got the Holy Ghost. place was rocking. Shouting and she went outside. I could see her outside in the office building. They rented that church in. She was out there, and the guy went out there with her and got in her. She said, Greg, that was wonderful. I said, I said Really? Did you like it? She said, It was just wonderful, Greg. I want to do that again. I went, Boom, shaka, flaka. I did, can I tell you today? This may be all new to you. I said, all of what I've said to say, God has been headed for you from before time. You've been coming this way. He's been coming this way. What are you saying? I'm saying God has had you on his mind since before he said, let there be light. I believe in a God that knew we was going to be here before we ever got here. That's what made him say, let there be light. Come on. That's what led him say, let there be greater light for the day and lesser light for the night. And let there be other lights. That's why we got stars. That's why the universe is 93 billion miles wide. Why? Because God said, let there be. Why? Because God wants to save. From Adam's mess. So God kept thinking and reasoning and counseling with himself until he thought and reasoned and counseled with himself about he became. He became what he thought. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The thinking, reasoning, counseling God was made flesh in the soft substance of the living body which covers the bone. Made means to come into existence. Began to be, to appear in history. Flesh denotes human nature, the earthly nature of man apart from the divine. God was divine, but when he manifest himself in flesh, he took upon him the nature of man. He was God, eternal, omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient. Omnipotent is all-powerful. Omnipresent means everywhere at the same time. Doesn't have to leave anywhere to get anywhere because he's already there before he leaves. 
He is omniscient. He is all-knowing. Tell somebody, God is all-knowing. And now that all-knowing, all-powerful, everywhere God is also in a fleshly body for the first time. He appears in history in the human nature. Paul's ministry was spent not just planting churches but also trying to lift up the head of the church because who Jesus is gives birth to the revelation of who we are. Therefore, the new birth experience of being born again of the water and spirit has been powerfully creative. John 3 and 3 through 5 says, Amen, you must be born again. You must be born again of the water and spirit. He didn't say to Nicodemus, you need to go to the booth, get in there, put a little petition between it, talk to a man through it. He's going to tell you to count a bunch of beads and light candles. There ain't no place in the Bible for that. Now, some of y'all didn't say amen. Just say amen because I'm right. Now, the people doing it and they're sincere, I understand. But that's why God filled you with the Holy Ghost so you could show them the rest of the truth. Amen. He told Nicodemus, one of the 70 rulers, he said, Nicodemus, you may be a ruler, but you must be born again. How am I going to do that? Of the water and spirit. How can I be born when I'm old? He said, no, no, whatever you born of flesh, you're flesh. You've been born from your mama, you can't change that. I'm talking about just like you're born in the flesh, so is the spirit baptism. You shall be born of the water, you shall be born of the spirit. What now, I'm gonna get plain. Some of you didn't say amen. Tell somebody, I forgot to say amen. I was headed for a close, but some of you are. So I'm gonna have to help you. Amen. I mean, you know, when mamas, do you remember when your water broke? Just say amen. amen. You remember where you was, house, home, bed, the kitchen, work, wherever you were. You remember where it broke. And you had to get rushed to the hospital. And in a little bit of time, hopefully less, not, not more than a day or so, you start pushing that little baby out. So that baby came through the water. And I remember when Gregory Paul was born, brought him out, that little, little mama and flipped him up by his lean. He was looking, he wasn't, he started snotting his nose and still wasn't nothing. He turned him up and went whack, 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 and slapped him on the butt. And, ah! All the nurses went, oh, there it is. Just like it is in the natural, so it is in the spirit. You are born of the water. You're baptized in water in the name of Jesus. Why? For the remission, the blotting out, the removal of my sins. And then when you're filled with the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God comes in you and proof to you that you've got the living Spirit, the living God in you, is you will begin to make a noise. Somebody say, make a noise. I'll speak with tongues. Tell somebody, I spoke with tongues, which was the evidence. That I was living. They went, I don't believe in that. Well, the natural reveals the spiritual. Then you must be a living dead man because you didn't believe. So receiving the Holy Ghost is just the second birth. What good is being born again do? When you are born again, he removes your sin from you as far as the east is from the west. Never to be remembered again. Now watch. The remembered again is on the only part of the one that matters if they remember. Now your friends, they remember. Tell somebody, say, my friends remember. Tell somebody, my friends remember because you know, some of y'all trying to act all holy. Just look at somebody say, they remember what I did. They remember what I said. They remember what I looked at. Now, I, I was preaching Porter, Texas. Jerry Greens was a man sitting back in the right, been there three weeks, had about 21 or so, got the Holy Ghost. And this man sat back there, he wouldn't move. I mean, he was like that fire extinguisher on that wall, just. I found out who his wife was and kids were, and they were up worshiping, running the house, and talking in tongues. And I'd give all the call, preach, he just sat there. Man, what in the world? About third Sunday. I walked back there, and he stood back there. He said, how you doing, Rickless? I'm doing good, but how you doing? He said, I'm doing good. I said, are you really? He said, yeah. He said, I just want to tell you, I don't need to be born again. I said, what? He said, I don't need to be born again. I said, 
what do you mean you don't need to be born again? He said, I've never sinned. Oh, was like, I mean, I got kind of, oh, Lord. I had to keep my composure, you know. I tied down a little sweat and running and preaching. And what do you mean you never sinned? He said, I've never sinned. I looked at me. and said, I've never drank, never done drugs, never, never looked at pornography. He said, I've never cussed. I said, you never cuss? Okay, let's get honest now. Everybody in this church is cussed. Raise your hand. One, two, three, come on. The rest of y'all can repent. <laughs> mama, now you're going to have to come on, Mama. Now I love you. But now, one more time. One, two, three, raise your hand. If you cuss, come on, raise your hand. Boy, I tell you, I'm going to do an altar call and come pray you through again. Get up here. <laughs> Amen. He said, I never cussed, never drank. He said, I never cheated at school. I said, what? I said, I started laughing. I said, you never cheated at school? Man, I got two or three times. I can see it as clear as day. I know I cheated. They all started laughing, but I set the hook, started reading it. <laughs> I can name the girl I was cheating off of, too. I'm telling you right now. I'm 60. I remember. Got about five answers and got convicted and stuff. went on there. Made an A on the test, so boom, shakalaka, hallelujah. <laughs> Everybody that's done it, raise your hand, one, two, three. There you go, rest of y'all, boy, I'm going to have a good altar call today. Some of y'all <laughs> lying like the demons of hell. <laughs> and so he's telling me he never cheated. I'm just like, you got to be kidding me, you never cheated. Well, I had, they about 25 of us, right? We laughing, cutting up, and in my mind I said, I got this little boy. He said, I'm telling you, I've never watched pornography. I've never looked at pornography in a magazine. He said, I've never, never been late for work, never cheated at work, never. He's just going to go, I never, I never, I never. And I'm like, wow. And while he's doing that, I'm going, okay, God, now, you got to help me. I'm going to say, okay, God, I need, I need a verse. Yeah, I need a verse. I need a verse. I need a verse. Bam, it came. I stopped. He got done. He said, so what do you think? I said, well, one verse comes to mind. He said, what's that? We were all born in sin and shapened in iniquity. He said, what's iniquity? I said, self-will. All of a sudden, a tear started running out of his eye. He started crying. We started praying with him about 10 minutes. Lifted his hands. 15 minutes. God filled him with the Holy Ghost. Baptized him in Jesus' name. God done. He said, boy, preach. He said, I love you. I said, I love you. Even as good as, I said, even as good a sinner as you was, I still love you. Hallelujah. <laughs> Tell somebody I was a good sinner. I wasn't a bad sinner. <laughs> we got these levels of hell, you know. The great sinners, the good sinners, the pretty good sinners, the eh, bad sinners, and then the demons from hell sinners. Amen. You know, it's all different levels of heat. And Ain't no different levels of heat. Everybody going to go. If you aren't born again, you're going to go to the same hell. You know, why, why was that? God made hell for the devil and his angels. Touch somebody and say, if you go to hell. Touch somebody and say, if you go to hell. Touch somebody and say, if you go to hell. Touch your neighbor and say, if you go to hell. You're going an intruder. It was never made for one human being on the planet. You say, well, then why is somebody going to go to hell? Because they chose to go. How did I choose to go? If you choose to reject Jesus and choose to refuse to be born again, you are saying, I want to go to hell. Tell somebody and say, you don't want to go to hell. Why? Because it's an eternal place of fire. It's eternal punishment. You will never die. I'm saying something now. I'm, I'm, I'm getting old, so my brain talks, and I listen to it before I say something else. But I'm saying something I hadn't said in 25, 30 years, preaching. If you go to hell, you are going to feel the intense heat of the lake of fire forever. How long is forever? Eternity. And then Lucifer and the third of angels that rebelled against God are going to be cast into the lake of fire with us. 
look at somebody and say, the devil is a lie. I am not going to the place it was made for the devil or his angels. That's what I'm saying. Today, you've got to make a choice. You were created by God. Our father Adam and mother Eve disobeyed God in perfect perfection. And they ate the fruit of the one tree in the garden. God only had one don't. Don't touch that tree. The devil came in there, started with his lying lips, started running his mouth. And however long it took, he finally went, Ash! Adam, look at this. Look, I took a bite. Look, I'm still here. Are you serious? Ash! Oh, my God. Thank you. They started seeing things they'd never seen. They saw themselves like they'd never seen. And they began to attempt to cover themselves with leaves. God could see everything looking down this piece of time at Adam and Eve. Made in his image and his likeness. He went to meet him in the cool of the day and he said, Adam, Eve, Adam, where art thou? Adam? Adam, Eve, Adam, uh, over here, Lord. I mean, he knew where they was. He just wanted them to answer him. Where, Adam? Uh, over here, Lord. Adam. What do you do with those leaves on you? Now, Lord. Uh, that one tree. Over there. Yeah, what about it? There was a snake over there and he kept talking to us. Yeah. Trying to get us to eat that fruit and yeah. But God knew it. He's wanting Adam to come clean. God knows everything we've done. Touch somebody and say, he knows everything I've done. So the reason we repent is we're coming clean. He says, yeah, we ate the fruit, Lord. You did what? We ate the fruit, the, you know, the tree that you told us not to touch. We, we ate it. You told us you had lied to us. What? He said, you lied. And to be like you, we had to eat that fruit. So we finally took a bite and didn't realize it until after we took the bite and then that's why we got these leaves on us. What? He's making them come clean. So, well, I'm going to have to move you out of this garden that I created east of Eden. This special dwelling place. I'm going to have to put you out and I'm going to put angels here at the doorway and you can't come back. So now, thousands of years have passed. We're in this upper room, man. Descendants of Adam. Touch somebody and say, I'm the descendant of Adam and Eve. He's all of our father and mother. Now you're hearing a message that Jesus had told the disciples on the day of Pentecost when that 120 received the Holy Ghost, evidenced by speaking with other tongues. Peter started preaching to him, said, You guys crucified the Lord of glory. Pricked in their heart. Verse 37. Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent, 
and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission, the blotting out of your sins, and you shall be filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost, heaven is by speaking with other tongues. He did not say, count beads on a necklace. He did not say, light candles. And light. He did not say, go to the booth and talk to a man through a screened area. He did tell somebody, he didn't say that. When they asked God, what shall we do? When they asked Peter, Peter said, this is what you got to do. You must be born again. 120 got the Holy Ghost at that first outpouring. And when Peter got done preaching before the day was done, about 3,000 more. The sun came up the next day and the Bible says about 5,000 more. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature or creation. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things become new. 1 Corinthians 3, 16, Know ye not that you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? Amen. Temple here is the sale of the temple where the Ark of the Covenant dwelt in the Old Testament, the tabernacle plan, outer court, holy place, holy of holies, that third room. That 15 by 15 square room, that was a foreshadowing of our body. What was important about that? The Spirit of God dwelled in that thing. Ephesians 1 and Colossians 1, Paul admonishes the church in Revelation that the church is the body of Christ. Tell somebody, when I got born again, tell somebody, when I was born again, I became a part of the body of Christ. Galatians 3, 27, for as many as you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. Now that you are born again, having been baptized into the body of Christ and have put on Christ, it is now Christ in us, the hope of glory. Amen. Tell somebody, I got hope. That's why I'm coming to church. Come on, tell somebody, that's why I'm coming to church is because now I'm getting hope. There's no hope in this world. There's nothing but down and out drug habits and alcoholism and craziness but in the church I've got hope in the church I've been delivered from my alcohol I've been delivered from my drugs I've been delivered from my nicotine I've got hope now Ephesians 1.22 says that we are his church which is his body and we have been set above all things and all things are under the feet of the church. All powers, principalities, rulers of this cosmos, spiritual weakness is under the feet of the church. He has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in Christ, in the church, in heavenly places. By being born again, we are living the, in the blessed place. I'm done. Ephesians 3 and 6 says, Gentiles shall be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of of his, his promise in Christ. How? By the gospel. Ephesians 2 and 11. In times past we were Gentiles. Without Christ. We were aliens. Which means shut out from fellowship. We were strangers. Which means we had no share in. We had no hope. We were expecting evil. And we were without God in this world. The word world here is cosmos or this present world system. Without God. Without being born again. We have no hope. But now. Ye who were afar off are made nigh. The word nigh means near in relation. How am I made near in relation to God? By the blood of Jesus Christ. Stand with me. I felt to preach this message, hopefully for some new ones that want to be born again. It's a lot of information, I know. But number two, I wanted to preach to reaffirm what your pastor I know has been teaching you. And that is he has been teaching the word of God. Tell your neighbor, pastor. Tell your neighbor, pastor. Has been teaching us the word of God. And now that you are born again, we were not a people, but now we are the people of God. We are now the apple of his eye. We are bone of his bone. We are royal diadems in his hand. We are his people. We are his bride. We are his body. Touch somebody and say, we are the church. 
So not only do you need to be born again, it'll bring you out of every habit, every mess. It doesn't matter how bad it is. It doesn't matter what you've done. What am, what am I going to do with my image? What are my friends going to say? Your friends are, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. When you get born again, the first day you go back to work, you walk in and people look at you and say, you okay? Something happened to you? And you're going to be able to say, boy, let me tell you what happened. What happened? I went to this church and they told us what Jesus had told the disciples and then told us what the disciples said Jesus said. And what did he say? He said, You must be born again. What? Huh? And that's what happened to me. What do you mean? That's what happened. Man, preacher got to preach. I feel what? Is he was reading my mail. What do you mean? He was telling stuff that I'd done. He don't even know me. What? I went to the altar and started praying and asking God to forgive me my sins. I said, you did what? Yeah. And I got done. I felt so good. And they told me, now, next thing you got to do, you got to be baptized. What do you mean? you got to be buried with Christ. Why? Because you died when you repented. So we got to bury the dead man. What? Uh, what? Now, I'm, I'm teaching Bible study now. That's how I teach Bible study. We bury a dead man. We bury in water. Baptize in water, the Bible says. We bury you, plant you. We don't sprinkle you. There's no place in the Bible we went. Nobody done that. You are buried with Christ in baptism. Baptism means to bury. We are planted together with Christ. What happened? Well, he said, I now baptize you in the name of Jesus. Why the name of Jesus? Because that's the name of God. What? That's the only place, that's the only way they baptize anybody in the scripture. In the New Testament church, they said Acts 2, Acts 8, Acts 10, Acts 19, they baptize them in the name of the Lord, the Lord Jesus. He never said in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Why? Because the name of the Father is not the Father. The name of the Son is not the Son. The name of the Holy Ghost is not the Holy Ghost. The name of the Father is Jesus. The name of the Son is Jesus. The name of the Holy Ghost is Jesus. They all baptize in the name of Jesus. Well, well what, 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 what does that do? That removes my sins. What do you mean? It, it washes my sins away from God's record in heaven. What? And he never remembers it again. I'm, are you serious? And then you come up out of the water and begin to worship, and God filled me with the Holy Ghost. What? The Spirit of God came in me. And I began to speak in my tongue. I began to make sounds that I didn't know what it was. It wasn't English. It wasn't no language that I knew of. But they told me that was the evidence or the proof that God had come into my body. Yeah. Look at somebody and say, have you been born again? Tell them if you haven't, you must be. Born again. Grab your neighbor by the hand. Now, I hope I get to come back two or three times this year. If not, I'll see you next year, hopefully. And if not, I'll see you on the other side. But I want to make it clear. There's one God. His name is Jesus. And he said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. You're religious. You're sanctified. You're one of the elders. It's all Old Testament, baby. You've got to be born again now. Of the water and the spirit. You must be born again. Well, we've talked to the church about outreach. The last three services and sessions. I think you've got it. And now I'm saying to you, this is what you tell them. You must be born again. Amen. Now you got your neighbor by the hand. I want you to lift it up in the air. Would you lift their hand up. On everybody in this church, 
I'm going to make an altar call. I want everybody to come out of the pew and come out up here around this pulpit as close as you can with your friend, whether you have the Holy Ghost or you don't have the Holy Ghost. If this is your home church, this is your pastor and his wife. She was here somewhere. There she is. I want you to come first, and I want the Easterlings Church to come in behind them. And we're going to all begin to worship God. And if you want the Holy Ghost, you can tell somebody you're with next to, say, I'd like the Holy Ghost. And we'll pray with you. And we believe God's going to fill you. Come on. Come to the altar. Come quick. Come in here close as you can. Come on. Come on. Begin to sing a little bit. Come on. Let's sing a little bit. <laughs>